Hey everybody, welcome to the Daily AI Show Interview Series. Today we're talking to Nicole Leffert. Uh, Nicole is currently the CMO and AI advisor, and we're going to be digging into that a little bit. And uh, people have called you, welcome Nicole, we, people have called you um, from all the mini hats, from campaign fundraiser to CMO and CEO and everything else. They've said you're a must-have asset, a coach and mentor, an incredible thought leader, and a brilliant fundraiser. So Nicole, welcome to the Daily AI Show interview series. We're really happy to hear you, have you. Um, and before we dig in, how are you? How's your day going? I am good. It has been a busy day. I've already trained a marketing team this morning on how to use AI. So I am like in speaking mode. <laughs> so. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Well, the goal of this um, interview is just really to get our audience to, to uh, know you a little bit more, so understand more of your uh, background, um, obviously what you're doing today. And obviously we're going to dig into all the, the fun AI stuff at the end and really uh, pull out all those those uh, marketing nuggets from you, because you certainly are the expert in the seat today. Um, before we really sort of like jump into current Nicole and what you're doing today, I thought it'd be you know interesting to go back a little bit because we can always learn so much about you know the individual from your background. So one of the things I, I noticed from you and we have actually in common is that we moved to Georgia, the metro a Atlanta area when we were kids. I moved when I was nine, you moved when you were 12. But yeah. what was interesting to me is you came from what this like a Southern California ranch to Metro Atlanta at 12, which is a really instrumental age. So what yeah. did that time, if you go back to it, like, how do you think that shaped you going forward? Yeah, I had an interesting childhood. So I was, I was born in Southern California and then my family moved. It was actually, the ranch was in Colorado, Colorado. Um, in a ski resort in Colorado in a very, in Steamboat Springs, which was a small town. And mm -hmm. then to move to Atlanta, which is a pretty big city. Uh, it was culture shock. You know, it definitely shaped me, but I think it is, it made me be very adaptable from a young age. And so I think that actually serves me when it comes to AI, because just starting as a kid, I had to learn new environments, new worlds, how to navigate new situations. And now it's a huge asset. Yeah, for sure. I was a, uh, my situation was I went from Long Island, New York to California for one year, California to Atlanta. So I had two parents who were from Brooklyn, New York. They, my dad worked in the airline industry and um, I had two parents from Brooklyn. And th what I remember more than anything, this is the eighties is uh, the company my dad worked for Western airlines was bought out by Delta airlines. And they said, if you want a job, you got to go to Atlanta. And my poor Brooklyn mom, you know, just looks my dad dead in the face and goes, where is Atlanta? Like, like no, no reference point to where, like, you know, I'm sure if you really told her, you know, but it just wasn't in her worldview at that time. We weren't all working around Google Maps. And like, it was such a fish out of water story for our whole family, too. And, um, you know, just trying to adapt to a, a very different environment in the, uh, you know, it's the late 80s, early 90s, you know? Yeah, you know, it's a different world here. It's a great world here. Uh, but yeah, and I think in Atlanta, everybody has at least like, somebody they know that works at Delta. <laughs> like it's just a rule. Well, yeah, everybody yeah. has one degree from Delta if you live in Yeah, Delta, place. Coke, Chick-fil-A, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Chick -fil -A, CNN, and Home Depot. Like we all and know Home at Depot. least one person at every one of those companies. So. <laughs> you know the names like Bob Minardelli and, and people like that when you live in Atlanta yeah. that, that may not mean anything to anybody else anywhere else, but you know them in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so that's, you get to Atlanta, you, you know, uh, you're at 12, but it's not too many years before you're off to college. And, and one of the things I really thought was cool was that you were actually a division one swimmer at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington um, for two years, which is super cool. And so here's another thing we have a little in common, although not the same, which is when I was in college at UGA, I was the manager of the huge sports rec facility. And so oh. I often had to go in at 4 a.m. and unlock the doors to the natatorium, which was inside of it, for, for the, swim the swimmers. And yeah. so I have these memories of it being dark outside and swimmers with big, you know, the big, big coats on coming to the front door. And I would watch them doing laps at like 4 a.m. And so I'm curious, you know, sort of like the first question, you know, Going back, when you think about doing those endless laps in the, you know, the natatorium early you on, and you're looking up the wall. Think about and... this. <laughs> 6 a.m. practices. <laughs> yeah. 
the uh the seeing the you know the the seahawk you know uh you know uh, green and gold on the yellow on the wall and then seeing the pennants and stuff like how did how did that you know shape you today because like that's a hard thing to do especially in college or at any age to have that dedication to get up over and over and over again so it shaped me in two ways one i don't do early mornings like (laughs) i refuse to do early mornings i mean i do them occasionally but my day today is not at 6 a.m anymore Mm. uh, because i don't have to um but no it really i think taught the importance of persistence and continuously putting the work in because swimming is an interesting sport in that it's like you practice and practice and practice and train and train and train for i was a sprinter so 24 25 seconds at a time of like actual sustained like that's when you actually see the work pay off and i think that's really helped me in my entire career because i'm used to like you put in the work and then like when it hits, it hits. Like you get the big payout on the end. And so, um, yeah, I think it definitely has shaped who I am because obviously to get to D1, like I had a lot of years of training prior to college as well. So it was very much a part of my life. I also bet, like I knew a lot of Georgia swimmers. So I bet we like know some mutual people or at least you unlocked the door for some of my friends. I might have. Funny. I might have. I think I'm a, I think I think I'm a little before you. I was in college from 96 to 2000. Um yeah. so So maybe not. Uh, maybe we, we, like tail end of your college was yeah. like my yeah, that's so funny. I, I yeah, started it was a, we had a, I uh oof. I should know his name because I worked with him all the time. But we had a we had a well respected um coach at the time from and the, he, he was uh, and he, yeah, he worked with the Olympic team for a while. He was one of their coaches and stuff. And so, God, I can't believe, you know, time goes by. I used to see him every single day. But I anyway. can't believe my mind is blanking either. My, so one yeah. of my best friends swam yeah. for him. And she is she was actually like a world record holder on the Georgia team. And she set the record with the Georgia relay. Okay, we are so off topic on AI. This is not what <laughs> I expected. And I love this. This is great. I sh- We should do this more. <laughs> no, no, this is I think this is all like I know you're saying it's not AI, but like, here's the thing. What we're going to get to here in a second is about AI and how you look at it through a different lens that's unique to you. And, you know, one of the things that I think is extremely like we'll call it unique. I mean, percentage wise is, you know, you're an entrepreneur, yes. you know, you're and, and that is a that's something that I have come to find in my mid 40s is a character trait more than a skill that's learned. I think it's because I consider myself an entrepreneur. I've done the traditional thing where I've owned businesses and run my own businesses and started them from scratch. But I don't do that today, but I still operate as an entrepreneur inside another organization. So it's a trait. It doesn't go away. Um, It's something that's usually built into people. And you are a perfect example of that because you started out of necessity, it seemed like, started your own company, Chocolatey, which I have the hardest time saying the name of, <laughs> but hopefully I said it <laughs> right. It's cho- it's I've heard it's Chocoli, um, oh, but that's I okay. I have heard it. over the years every possible pronunciation of the word. It was actually just chocolate, and my nickname growing up was Coley, so it would be just put them together, Chocoli. There you go. So, yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of like, you know, I grew up on rap and hip hop and stuff like that. And Tribe Called Quest had a song and in the middle of one of their songs, uh, what's the scenario? Buster Rhymes says, chickadee chocolate, the chocolate chicken. And so like, that's the only thing I could hear in my head after that. And I could, I was just going over the lyrics. And I'm looking at my wife last night. And I'm like, I'm going to mess this up. I'm not going to get it right because I had like the wrong word in my head. That's so funny. Now that chocolate business definitely primed me to be ready for the AI yeah, stuff tell me about because... So I started it while I was still in college and I, it was an e-commerce chocolate company. So B2B yeah. and B2C, but e-commerce based. Um, actually the first few days of it, the first few months of it were not e-commerce. I was just cold calling from my parents' living room, uh, yeah. selling chocolate to chocolate fountain providers to use in their chocolate fountains. Sorry. And, um, I, uh, somebody said, do you have a website? And I was like, oh yeah, it's almost done. I will, I will get that to you ASAP. Yeah. Ran to the bookstore about how to build a website for dummies and went inside in a coffee shop, read it and like made my first website, which you would laugh 
so hard if you saw it. Like, don't go on the Wayback Machine. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Chocoli.com circa 2004 because it is a wow. laugh. Um, but so ended up not that long after building an e-commerce functionality and really grew up with this business as a B2B and B2C e-commerce business. But you have to realize this was in the era before Shopify existed, before, right. a, before e-commerce was even really a things. So we were working with developers like to help us build custom websites that could do what we needed it to do and navigating this world that nobody know, nobody knew, you know, like especially selling food online. That was really unheard of in the early 2000s. <laughs> like that yeah. was, you know, you needed to figure out how to do like temperature control and all, you know, cold yeah. shipping and all of these right. things with an e-commerce website. Yeah, that's still challenging to get an e-commerce website to do that. But so basically was... you and Gary Vaynerchuk, right? You guys were the, you were the leaders. <laughs> you were selling wine and you were selling chocolate. I love it. Yeah. You know, it's, a, <laughs> it's so funny because it really is. And it's so funny now. So I, um, during building that business, I did a program with somebody named Perry Marshall, who is like considered a very big deal in the marketing coaching mm -hmm. world, but mm -hmm. did a intensive like more private program with him. I think we spent $10,000 to do this program, which mm. at that time, I mean, it's still a lot of money. Let's not lie. Still, yeah. <laughs> still a lot of money. Uh, but to learn how to do Google AdWords, and this was before companies were, you, you know, like big companies were using it. it was brand new. I think it was 2006 and did this intensive program with Perry, flew out to his house and sat down and got private coaching. And it mm. was wild and it was awesome. And it helped us like completely build our business to be one of the yeah. top 1000 internet retail companies in the country for a few years running. And, you know, all of it now, it just comes around because I'm like, I kind of feel like I'm in a way following in Perry's footsteps with the AI stuff, totally different, my own flair, like, sure, sure. but I see a lot of Perry's influence and I hear him in my head a lot, like things that he told me in those early days around navigating, mm -hmm. you know, Google ads, e-commerce, this entire tech world that didn't exist and we were building the plane while we were flying it back then yep. and that primed me to do it with ai which i thought exactly. the course moved fast but oh my gosh ai moves like at 10x speed even of what that e-commerce experience was like so well, i think i think you brought up exactly what I, I i think that's exactly what i saw in that too when i was looking you know and i was doing some research is yeah, you, you said it, you know, we're building the plane while we were flying it. And I know I, I remember not around the same time, 2000. Uh, no, I was I was a decade later, 2014. I was already a firefighter and all that stuff. When I when I owned my first business, it was a CrossFit gym. So brick and mortar. And the second one was an online nutrition company that came out of that. My wife's a dietitian, And so we ran that for several years. Um, and each time it was like back to college back to college. Like, I mean, not, not figured it, not, not like physically, but every single time, you know, I had college, then I had my master's degree, then I had running my business, then I had running the second business. And now the fifth iteration of that is AI. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's once again, back to college, back, whatever, you, whatever you knew, gather that up and that's your base. But now you have this new thing that you have to do. And so, you know, whether it was you running that company or, you know, walking, um, you know, on the beach sands of Williamson <laughs> Beach and selling your your uh, your visitor's guide that you did, yeah. which was super cool as well. Um, you know, and then, you know, after yeah. I stopped with the chocolate, I worked for, I actually got a job for somebody else, which, you know, that was a weird experience. But um, <laughs> for me, the entrepreneur forever, but I worked for a B2B SaaS company as their head of marketing. And yeah. that was like learning a whole nother, you exactly. know, world too, um, in many ways. Although it was interesting because e-commerce translated so much to SaaS. Like being on the side of having built out the e-commerce tech, I was like, oh, this is the exact same thing once I got into yeah. it um but yeah it just you know it's you build all of these skills and it's so interesting because it is like starting over in the co new college education like you're talking about but at the same time i see where every one of these puzzle pieces equips me to actually be able to do what i'm doing now really good like had i not done this i wouldn't be able to do this had i not done this i wouldn't be able yeah. to do this and it, i just love how it so all important together to have that you know and we're seeing this more and more we we're just talking about this on the main show 
um, how having these having a diversification of, of skill sets, uh, the soft skills as well as the, the hard skills, you know, um, really, really comes into play. And um, that's what I would love to get into with you a little bit more, because, OK, we've established at this point that. 20 plus years of marketing experience. You've seen everything from, from the advent and age of Facebook ads when you could actually do something with Facebook ads, you know, and, and get... The first week, it was so funny. Like, it's so funny how much Facebook ads have changed. Over oh my God, yeah. Years. Yeah, and where, and where they're even, where they'll probably go and you can tell us where you think they're going to go in the age of AI, um, ads in general for that. Um, but you've seen that evolution. Now, so much has changed in marketing versus maybe 20 years, the same 20 year period prior, it would have been largely the same. We would have seen the advent in the internet, but it would have been largely the same marketing. But now here you are and you're an expert in your field, but oh, here comes AI. Not only here comes AI, but AI seems to have a scope and a sight on marketing as it does with some other targeted areas where we're predicting there to be just as, you know, more disruption than other areas. Um, where do you see that, like, as you look at that pivot, you've, everything you've set up to this point has helped you, but how do you stay positive going forward in marketing as a marketing professional where other people are saying, I don't know, is, is my job, is my job about to expire? You're obviously not taking that approach. Yeah. I think that, you know, from where I'm sitting, I don't think that the people who actually learn and embrace this technology are going to be at risk. I think that the people that are at risk are the ones who refuse to learn and embrace this technology. Um, and I also think that like the earlier you start learning and embracing it, the easier it is to learn and each new thing that gets added. And I go back to that experience with like Google AdWords in the early days. And, you know, when I learned that, I really learned from that experience, Google Ads wasn't what it is anywhere near now, right? Like mm. it was very manual, it was A-B testing like yourself and doing all this crazy stuff that like you had to figure out how to make it work back then. And I, because I learned it from like day one, essentially of Google ads existing or very, very early, they would add one feature at a time. And it mm. wasn't that hard to learn because they were added one feature at a time and you didn't have to learn this massive suite of all kinds of things. You just had to learn that one thing and how to maximize it. And then they bring in the next thing. Now, how, what's this one thing and how do I maximize it? And so learning, having that experience, I think AI is very, very similar. And I'm having the exact same mirror experience, like with Chad GPT, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, I had already been using AI for over a year when Chad GPT came out. So I was at a advantage from day one in Chad GPT. But getting in there, you know, I, when, if you were on there in the first few days, anybody who was knows it was like a screen and you type something in and it was just a back and forth conversation. <laughs> there was nothing else in Chad GPT to know. So you just right. had to figure out how do I have that conversation? And yep. now then they added, you know, like one thing at a time really slowly. I mean, slowly, it's been a year. and It doesn't resemble <laughs> anything yeah. that it was a year ago. But like, you know, they added one piece at a time and you only had to learn that one piece at a time by having started a year ago. Now, if you're just getting in today, you have to go in and you need to understand, okay, what are custom instructions? What is the edit prompt button? How do I regenerate? When do I do those things? How much, you know, like how much um, guidance should I give? When do I give a document? When do I give a link? When do I give a screenshot? Like all of these different pieces where those of us who were there a year ago only had to understand one little bit of that at a time and then mm -hmm. see how do I stack that together. So you're at this huge advantage because you really got to learn it at a slower pace. As crazy and fast as it's moving, you got to learn it more slowly. And now yeah. one thing comes out at a time, you get to integrate it. GPTs came out, we already understood how to do everything. And so it made it, it was very easy to step into GPTs. Now mm -hmm. flip that to somebody who's coming in today. And you walk in and think about, it's already a little bit like, whoa, if you've never done this, now it's not too scary. It's not too much to get into, but it's a little bit more than we had to bite off when we signed up for Chad GPT a year ago or sure. over a year ago. Yeah. Now, totally still accessible right now, but if you wait another year, 
to get into this, think about how much harder, how many more things you're going to have to learn from day one than yeah. somebody who starts today, because we can't even fathom where this is going in the next year. And while it's going to get easier in many ways, I think it's also going to get harder in many ways because there's just going to be so much more you need to understand and be literate about. So when I look at it and I talk to marketers, I'm like, I know you might be scared, but it is something that is so cool and can do so much great stuff for you. And if you are the person that understands it inside out right now, you are the person who is securing your long term job stability because you are always going to be ahead of the curve. You're going to be able to learn one thing at a time and understand how to integrate it versus the people who wait another year, another two years. Eventually, this is going to be table stakes. This is going to be the same as email or doing a Google searches right now, expected job skills. Sure. But ones who know how to really leverage it are going to be positioned to be successful. Now, what does that mean for broader marketing? I mean, God, you know, who really knows? Like so much is going to change. But from a personal standpoint, we can take care of ourselves and protect ourselves at most. So and this like, seems to, uh, if I can jump in, this yeah. seems to to like point to something that uh, that I think that uh, like is your reputation in this world, which is just like you've just done. Um, uh, the you know the successful uh, metric is um, give away ninety percent of what you know and charge for the last ten. And how did you come? Like, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's how outside we see you. That I give away ninety percent and charge hey, for you the last are ten. So generous, <laughs> like. <laughs> Back I mean, to those like account. coming out one at a time. I remember sitting in the AI exchange, like exchanging, like Nicole, do you have it yet? Beth, do you have it yet? <laughs> what? Okay, like, what does it look like to you? What does it look like to me? Yeah, like you've just been so generous. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, I thought uh, like I think it's my personality. First off, just to handle things that way, it's worked, right? So like I've built a successful AI business. And I think also just it's intuition, like, you know, part part of what I'm doing, I just like really passionately care about people building AI literacy. So that's a lot of giving away so much. Right. But there's a huge difference. Like when I do work with companies, they're getting it personalized, right? So like when I'm giving it to the public, you know, on LinkedIn, on TikTok, on, you know, wherever, you know, if I do a speaking engagement, they're getting a version that's generalized to everybody. Now, I do think it is really high quality guidance and content and teaching. But then when I get in with a marketing team that I'm training, they're also seeing examples of like, you've explained it, now show it to me with me and like teaching them how to do it with their own content. How does this translate to your company, your brand, your work, also your security rules? Like, you know, what are the things you are and aren't allowed to do with it? And so I love it because I'm able to like give so much and teach people. Like if you're willing to learn, you and yeah. you're willing to dig in and do the work. Like I post so much free content. <laughs> That's what I wanted to bring up. You mentioned it, but I, I do want to give you props because I remember, so we met each other. We didn't really get into this. We met each other in the AI exchange, which is an online Slack community as well as other things, but that's where all three of us uh, got to know each other. And yes, I remember that, what we'll call the early days since we're one of the, we're like the OGs, right? From a year ago. Like a year so ago. we think about that. <laughs> we were all in there in the chat, like actively doing things live and talking back and forth, like Beth said. But I remember it was April and you're like, guys, I'm going to start a TikTok channel. There's no reason for me not. We're like, go for it. Go do TikTok, Nicole. So you post the first video. It's still up there for anybody who wants to see it. And you're like, hey, I don't know if anybody's going to watch this, blah, blah, blah. Now cut to this. That's just April. Cut to you have 13,000 followers. You've done over 150, 60 videos on there. All of them are geared towards helping and trying to help understand. And just a day or two, you had on there one about you had this green smoothie and you tell a story really quick about I have this green smoothie. And then I wanted to know what kind of all nutritional, you know, goodness is in this green smoothie. And you use ChatGPT. So you're, I love that you use stories. That's what I wanted to point out is that you use stories to help people connect. I'm such a big fan of stories as a bridge to connect between concept and deployment. But can you tell us a little bit more about like these posts and this green smoothie idea or the riddle one? And you know, oh, wait, sort of I got how one you I have it put on social. I can tell you that's so. Well, What's that? 
I might have talked about it. I've got a cool one that I've got to tell you. Here's where these things come from. First off, my TikTok channel is it's not necessarily marketing directed because mm. you don't necessarily get to decide who sees right. your content on TikTok. So my LinkedIn is very marketing focused, like very, very professional. My TikTok has that stuff, but it also has like that random thing I just did. And I like, yeah. I'm dying to tell somebody and like, I probably don't want to just continuously like clog the AI exchange. So I just put it on TikTok. So that's what the green smoothie <laughs> came from. was like, I just did this. Ooh, I should make a TikTok video. There was yeah. no like, I love it though. It's so, unique. it's so personalized. It is and so I think, that's what the word well, is. <laughs> sure. But here's, here's the way I look at this, Nicole. And I think you do it. You do this brilliantly. And, and hopefully what, what people will get out of listening to this, who have never met you before on this, on this interview is Look, there's other people doing marketing and AI. There's other people doing sales and AI. There's other people doing Salesforce and AI, right? That's the, we're not unique in that sense in what yeah. we individually do, but we are very unique in, into ourselves, right? So right. what what I love is that the, the TikTok, even if it's not marketing, is showing who Nicole is. Yeah. And then people get to decide, oh, that's who I want to work with. If I have to be in a room learning about marketing and AI and something that I'm uncomfortable with or whatever, let's see, let's see who, yep, it's Nicole. I want to be in the room with Nicole because that sounds like a fun time or at least less painful than, you know, uh, having to learn this new skill that all of a sudden has come up in the last year. Thank you. I get the feedback a lot that like, I'm so passionate about the AI that it comes through because obviously yeah. I mean, like I spent my weekend and I'm like, oh, I got to make a TikTok video about making a green smoothie nutritional information with chat, yeah. you know, with chat GPT. I have to tell you guys the coolest thing I did with AI, like the uh, this yeah. week that I was so excited about. So my dad is remodeling his bathroom mm -hmm. and he, he had a leak and he has to remodel his bathroom and there he's at the point where he had to pick paint colors. And so I took, had him take pictures of his bathroom where it's at right now. The shower is done and the vanity is in there. Had him take pictures, gave it to Chad GPT and at, told it, gave it the persona of an interior designer, mm -hmm. had it tell us like suggestions of paint colors that would be good and asked it to like draw the paint swatches or not to use code interpreter with hex codes to make the paint sure. swatches. So then he could hold it up to his wall on his phone to see the paint colors and decide how does this look? And then he could take it to color match at the paint store, what the colors that ChatGPT suggested versus like, you know, the actual paint chips. It also, we also had it um, figure out the bare paint colors that went with it and mm -hmm. like the codes and everything. And it sent, and then go to the internet and send us links to those pages so we could see sure. it. The only thing that went wrong with that was it turned out when he actually went in person, the way it looked on his screen didn't yeah. match. <laughs> so, but I don't think that was an AI's fault. I actually think that was more like the way that they put through on right. their stuff. But it was so cool. I was like, we are literally using AI to remodel a bathroom. Like, yeah. how this world we live in is so cool. It's so cool. So that one's made so up talking, I don't think. Maybe. As we sort of wrap this up, I want to, I just want to basically hand the mic to you and, and give you an opportunity to talk because I really do want people, we've talked about a lot, your background and all that, but you know, right now I know you are working. I mean, I get to, I get to hear your success stories of working with teams and what they say about working with you um, as uh, you know, specifically like as a CMO, you know, AI advisor, let the audience know what, like, what does that mean? Who are you currently working with? Who's your ideal audience or not your ideal audience, but ideal client. Um, so that if they're listening to this, they can, they can reach out to you. Yeah. So I am working with um, companies anywhere from series A through, I have fortune 50 companies that I work with. So it's, pretty much runs the gamut. Um, and I usually am working with their marketing teams. Occasionally I work with broader go to market or teams beyond market or like in the entire company. Um, but I come in, usually it's the CMO that brings me in and I work with them to understand their team's needs and then customize a training for their team to teach them the AI skills that they need to be able to like actually start to leverage AI within their marketing. Um, and then some I continue to work 
with on an ongoing basis with, you know, keeping them updated on skills, consulting, advising, etc. cetera. Um, but the main thing I'm doing is those trainings. And as far as like my ideal client for that, uh, the vast majority of companies I'm working with are B2B SaaS companies. So mm -hmm. anybody in the B2B tech space, but anywhere from Series A all the way up through Fortune 50. Although I do have a good number of clients that are not B2B SaaS as well that come to me. I just, the niche that like I've really, you know, become known in is that B2B SaaS space. So, um, but I have, I have companies that are physical e-commerce products because I do have that e-commerce background. I have B2B companies that are nothing to do with technology. Um, yeah. So all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Well, so listen, Go ahead. Go ahead, Beth. If you, uh, the links for Nicole will be in the description of the uh, of this episode. So if you want to do more or find out more about her, check out the TikTok. Uh, just uh, just look down in the description. And uh, definitely yeah. connect on LinkedIn too, especially if you're interested in the marketing stuff. Go find me on LinkedIn. Follow me there because I post a ton on the marketing side on LinkedIn. Um, and if you are interested in you know trainings for your team, I'm very transparent. Like all my pricing is on my website, so you don't have to get on like a sales call to hear how much I charge. It's, you know, I try to lay it all out for you. So make it easy on them. Make you know, they want to, they want to work with you. They, they know why they need you. So, yeah. um, there's no reason to, to hide or, or any of that stuff. I'm sure. Well, listen, yeah. um, we're on time. So we're going to, we're going to wrap this up, but Nicole, uh, you're a rock star and I, um, had, a really, really good time getting to research you even before this interview. I mean, we've known each other for a while now, but I was saying to my wife, I said, oh, what a what a um, nice, you know, add on when you get to just sit down and like look into somebody's past and go, oh, Jesus, she did that. Oh, she was a swimmer. And oh, she lived in Atlanta. You know, like it's fun, you know, and it, it seemed like a really uh, it was a really nice sort of reward or, or bump for me to be able to do that. So appreciate you coming on here and hanging out with us uh, for the Daily uh, Show interview series. And um, yeah, that's our time. We will have this uh, available for everybody soon on all our channels. Um, so go check it out and make sure you go follow Nicole, follow her on TikTok, go check her and, and um, uh, follow her on LinkedIn and uh, you will get all the goodness and then check out her website as well. Nicole, we really appreciate your time today. Always a pleasure to be with both of you. So thank you guys so much for having me. All right, bye. <laughs>